Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Good Roads Podcast. I am Jared LeMay, and with me, finally done pulling his hair out with planning the Good Roads Conference, Thomas Barricat. It's been a whirl- whirlwind couple of months, hasn't it, Thomas? It has, Jared, and I, I don't have much hair left, um, but uh, I hope hopefully some of it will grow back. <laughs> All right, and for those who don't know, the Good Roads Conference has been shifted for the first time in 128 years from late February to April 10th to 13th. Uh, for more details on uh, what these changes mean, you can check out ograconference.ca. Uh, but we'll be keeping the same format, the same keynotes, and the same great time that the Good Roads Conference has always been known for for over a century. Um, anything else to add to that, Thomas? No, just uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the the spring conference this year rather than the <laughs> the usual winter conference. So. There we go. There we go. It'll be nice and warm. And um, yeah. Well, so, let's, not, let's not jinx it, Jared. Yeah, I know. This has been a weird couple of years. So uh, anyway, um, today our guest is uh, one of the aforementioned keynote speakers who will be joining us in person in April for the 2022 Good Roads Conference. Uh, He's one of the co-founders of New Localism Advisors, a firm to help cities design, finance, and deliver transformative, innovative uh, initiatives that promote inclusive and sustainable growth. He's also an author of a couple of books, most recently, The New Localism, uh, How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism. And uh, I'll leave a link to that in the show notes so you can check it out. It's a fantastic book. I've, uh, I'm a few chapters into it already. Uh, welcome to the Good Roads Podcast, Bruce Katz. Well, thanks for having me. Awesome. We look forward to having you at the conference. So uh, we're going to get things started um, right off the bat for our listeners who may not be familiar with it. Um, what's the basic premise of New Localism? So the basic premise of New Localism is that the nature of problem solving in societies. It's quite different in the 21st century than the 20th. If you go back 70 years, um, US, other industrialized nations, Canada, it was really seen as a top-down exercise, um, particularly governments dealing with whatever the environmental or economic or social challenges of of that period was. And you, you created this whole sort of enterprise and, and of specialized bureaucracies and agencies uh, in, in mature economies to solve your problems. I mean, pick a problem, you created an agency, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. or Department of Transportation or Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the list just goes on and on. In the 21st century, I think what has emerged for both structural reasons but also cyclical reasons. Our federal government comes in and out of functionality. Uh, (laughs) um, We we have long periods where it's hard to know what our federal government is doing. Right now, it's in one of its bursts of activity. Um, But during this whole, let's say, last 20, 30 years, what's what's been remarkable is that problem solving has really been bottom up. It's really been networked across public, corporate, civic, community, Um, It's really tried to harness the full energies that exist in cities, metropolitan areas, other parts, uh, other geographies of our of our societies. Um, And that's because I think 21st century problems tend to be multidimensional. They're really not solved by just a rule or a regulation or a one shot piece of legislation. They do require all sectors to come together around design, finance, and delivery. So that, that's the premise of new localism. We, we've entered a world of network governance. At times, we can't see that world because our national media is so obsessed with our national governments, um, particularly when the governments are spending a lot or particularly right. when we're in the middle of a global pandemic, <laughs> that it sort of distracts us from seeing how the world actually operates. Right. Um, even in this period, as I'm sure we'll talk about, I think most of the solutions um, that are meaningful and sustainable are going to be bottom up. And um, federal governments may be investors. They may occasionally provide guidance that's helpful. But, you know, at the end of the day, I I think we're in a very different century with very different um, actors and an almost thesis of problem solving. Okay. Um, So I'm not uh, as... uh... I guess, in tune with the policy side of things like you and Thomas are. So um, I'm going to try and keep up with you guys. You guys are probably a lot more ahead of me, but um, 
like I said, I, I'm a few chapters into your book and even the first chapter of the book, uh, Power Reimagine, that discusses a lot about how the dynamic of power is changing. And um, it used to be a top-down approach, like you were saying. Um, I, I guess with that, uh, what, I guess, actors would you say, um, what what actors nowadays in a bottom-up approach would be responsible for, for these solutions? I know lower orders of government, for example, in Ontario and Canada municipal, but are we like, I, you mentioned private enterprises as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let me use an example in the U S I mean, I, and, and this could apply to many of our uh, communities, but I'm doing some work in Erie, Pennsylvania right now. Okay. Uh, the city of Erie is about a hundred thousand people. Let's say the County is a couple hundred thousand. So it's a relatively small um, metropolitan area. Right. Um, but it, it, it was an industrial powerhouse, like many of our older industrial cities of the Midwest were. Uh, it's been rocked by deindustrialization. I'm sure this will be very familiar to a lot of your Canadian <laughs> jurisdictions. Um, it sounds but, a lot like Oshawa, actually. Oshawa was uh, the c- uh, central for GM. and um, Yeah, well, that's um, – and this was more of a GE <laughs> uh, sort of factory town, I suppose. But the bottom line is it sits on Lake Erie. So incredible natural resources, historic downtown, post-Civil War, post-American Civil War. And around that downtown sit three major anchor institutions, uh, Gannon University, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, and Erie Insurance Corporation, which is a Fortune 500 company in the United States. So it always had these assets, natural assets, and the high concentration of large anchor institutions with major employment um, and with very large balance sheets. In the last decade, what you've seen is this remarkable network, coalition of the mayor, the county executive, the traditional elected officials coming together with um, the corporation, the universities, and there are other universities, Penn State, Barron, Mercyhurst, Edinburgh, the hospitals, all basically saying, we're going to work harder for the city in which we're located. Okay. We're going to unlock our wallets with our philanthropies. We're going to capitalize new kinds of development corporations. We're going to bring the waterfront back. We're going to bring the downtown back. We're going to have the benefit of that, radiate to low-income residents and adjoining neighborhoods, you know, we're not waiting for Washington because, you know, that could be a long wait. And whatever Washington does, it may be aligned with us. It may not. Right. I mean, they make decisions, you know, based on lots of other criteria. So this is like a really powerful network of corporate, civic, community, public leaders working when they have to with their state government and the federal government, but also looking to unlock private investment, local capital. And we can come back to this as well. So a lot of wealth in the United States, but most of that wealth tends to get exported to our coast, to Silicon Valley, to Boston, to New York. Um, and I think what's beginning to happen, it was happening pre-COVID, I think it'll be accelerated post-COVID, is people want to invest back in their communities. And part of that is buy local, you know, obviously hire local, locate in, in smart ways, but also invest local. And I, I think something's been unleashed um, and this desire for community and desire for impact, you know, in the place where you live is not something that you need to run for office to achieve. You can do it from these different perches. So would you, Bruce, uh, listening to what you're, what you're saying here, would you maybe not as like, no, we're not, I don't want to go to causation here, but would you say that it's almost a response to this deindustrialization um, that has happened over the past uh, decades? And, um, because we know that, I guess, the flip side of that is perhaps uh, populism, which we've seen, you know, th- the backlash to all of this happen. So is, is the new localism almost the, it's not a, maybe not an institutional response, but it's how these different institutions can come together and respond, whereas populism is something else? Well, I think p- populism and what I would call almost a kind of, uh, you know, relentless <laughs> pragmatism. Are, are, are both responding to similar things. I mean, you know, our countries have been racked by deindustrialization, and we, we have found out 
you know, what are the true implications when you decide to just offshore everything? <laughs> you know, well, supply chains break down. Hello. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't get that protective equipment delivered. Um, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, of our ships sit off the shore of Long Beach. I mean, a whole bunch of things have broken down to this pandemic and, and have unveiled, I think, how much our national economies really had gone out of whack. So populism is about grievance. Um, it is about those jobs that we've lost, those quality jobs that pay well with decent benefits. Um, new localism is about, that's fine, let's solve the problems. If we need macro policy changes, let's advocate for them. But let's use the tools and the rules we have to work harder for the places in which we live and our, you know, our corporations, our enterprises are located and, and really take our assets and our advantages, which are ample across multiple places and have a two plus two equal five effect. So I, I you know, it's very much about, about um, leaders, but at all levels really, who are putting shoulder to the wheel and have been doing it for decades because Washington was on a frolic and a detour, they just had left. <laughs> um, like Elvis, they had left the building and it's not entirely yeah. clear where they went. Um, they come back in and out of consciousness, you know, depending on, you know, partisan arrangements. But the re, you know, the cities will be here today. They'll be here tomorrow. They'll be here in the future. They're not going anywhere. The question is whether you can take whatever hand you've been dealt and, and make the best out of it. Okay. Um, I guess further to that, um, with with the federal government not being the be all end all, um, but them, I guess, w with the way things have been over the last couple decades, uh, they they've sort of a, a amassed or accrued their own uh, amount of power. Uh, what should these higher levels of government, federal, uh, state in the U.S. and or provincial in Canada, uh, what can they be doing to help the um, I guess, spur on a more localized approach, helping the municipalities, helping the private industry. Well, I always thought the federal government in the U.S. was a healthcare company with an army. So, um, <laughs> you know, a lot, a, lot, a lot of what it does really is, uh, um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, reimbursements of health expenses or our military budget, but all the research and development we have in the United States, which is ample, which is a very large part of our competitiveness, Right. Um, really is in the service of health innovation and military innovation and occasionally, occasionally energy innovation. So that comes and does. Um, so what you want from our national government is uh, to be a smart investor, um, to set the rules in such a way that the private sector and these other networks of leaders at the local level, metropolitan level, can, can really unlock the full potential of their places. Um, the federal government is not going to tell Erie, for example, um, what are you going to do along your waterfront or which infrastructure should you build in your downtown or in the broader metropolis? But that's really locally based. So, right. you know, so they may invest a lot um, in various parts of our economy, but at the end of the day, design and delivery is intensely local. Right. Right. But they've got, yeah, yeah, the federal, the federal governments, they've got the resources though, to make this stuff happen. So I guess, um, municipalities, for example, what should they be asking of the federal government? What should they be saying? Like, is there, for example, we need a hospital. Um, can you help us get this done? Is that something, or should they be looking, I guess, to more of a private, um, I, I think what they should be asking is for the right kinds of investments that can be deployed flexibly. Okay. Because the bottom line is, you know, Phoenix ain't Pittsburgh, right? I mean, yeah. so when you differentiate between these older places and newer places, the federal money needs to adapt to radically different circumstances. So what we really want from a federal government is to trust the local. Okay. Um, what the federal government mostly does is pile on a lot of rules. Um, <laughs> it is a heroic act, to tell you the truth, to use federal money. I mean, don't do this for the faint of heart, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. tough. So it sounds wonderful. A lot of money. It's all coming, but a lot of rules uh, layered on top. So what I think what the, what the locals really want is they want predictability of funding, stability, and flexibility. 
Sure. And then they'll get around the business of actually doing stuff. Yeah. And that's what Thomas and I were talking about before this. We were talking, what were we talking about, Thomas, the federal infrastructure fund? Yeah. Well, yeah. And just, yeah, on that, but for, yeah. So essentially, I guess, Bruce, you said a few things here that really clicked in my head. So yeah, a lot of the times when a different order of government, a federally, federal, provincial, whatever, they kind of, when they have an infrastructure program, I mean, it, a lot of the times it reflects their priorities and not the local priorities. And that's sometimes an issue we hear from our members all the time. Well, we have to, we have a capital backlog of, you know, X amount and this new infrastructure program that you're putting out doesn't allow me to apply for this to fix that. So now, you know, this is going to go into disrepair and, uh, uh, you know, but there's other money sitting there for other projects, which maybe, you know, are not as important to that community. So, uh, yeah, to, to, to Jared's point, we were talking about the investing in Canada infrastructure program, um, which was first unveiled by the Trudeau government in 2015 as part of that election campaign. And um, yeah, it has it's it's done good, but there's also a lot of um, I guess trouble getting some of that money out the door at some points because some a lot of these communities were saying uh, you know we don't have the 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 projects ready for that. We were actually we have all these other things that are shuffle ready, but they don't qualify for this. And then on top of that, there's a bit of a an administrative burden because you have to apply to the program to the federal government so that they can make sure it's you know properly vetted. Um, whereas the local council has approved this, you know, five years ago, and it's just on their capital uh, backlog. So there definitely is that, uh, I guess, that friction in terms of priorities uh, uh, between the different levels of government. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's also, you know, we have this like mid 20th century view of who's in charge, you know, like if you think about societies as like a pyramid, if it's, if the federal government thinks they're at the top of the pyramid, Right. You have the president, the vice president, 535 people in Congress. I mean, we're, we're a country of 320 million people. I mean, you know, like, let's get a grip here. I mean, I, I, I think really at the top of the, of the hierarchy are cities and metropolitan areas and communities. They're the delivery system. And the federal government should be acting in the service of these places. So I just flipped the pyramid, and um, which is easy to say, you know, hard to do. But I, they work for us. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's really the right. bottom line. And, and, and I think what we really need is, to, is to, to recalibrate this relationship between the federal and the local. Because mm -hmm. they, they are sort of trying to circumscribe solutions when, frankly, in countries that are as large as ours, you know, the best innovation is going to happen from, you know, allowing for experimentation across right. many places. And I mean, yeah, it doesn't even have to be a large country like the U.S. Like Canada is 38 million, I believe. And pretty large. We, we even have a, a disconnect there. You hear the Prairie Provinces talk about how they don't feel represented by Ottawa because they're working for uh, Toronto, which is our biggest city. And um, yeah, things like that. So yeah, it, it, from large to small, it sounds like it's um, it, it may be something that the federal government should work on and maybe the smaller orders of government should discuss if that makes any sense. I mean, you're a very large land mass, obviously. Yeah. And, and you're, and obviously the, uh, you know, the industries that have emerged on the Eastern part of your country and the Western part are, are radically different over many generations. So the national government has to allow for adaptation, you know, to, radically different starting points and strengths. Right. Um, it doesn't really like to do that, right? It, it tends to want a cookie, you know, one size fits all. This is the program that's going to apply to everyone. But it has to be adaptive. Um, right. Well, and they're even in the in the position to, to adapt it to each area. Um, I mean, we have representatives for each area, but I mean, that can only go so far. Like, like you've been saying, um, the, the lower orders of government have their fingers on the pulse of that area. They know what's, what's right for it. Um, they should be, I guess, as you said earlier, trusted a little more. Well, you're also a state and province driven country. Yeah. You're a little like Germany. I mean, we're all federal republics, federal, you know, but you put a lot of power into your states. We put power into all of our tiers, you know, and then we put an enormous amount of power into our private and civic sectors. Um, so the U.S. is really the, uh, you know, exemplifies network governance. 
Some days it's a private public enterprise than a pu- rather than a public private enterprise. Um, it just depends on the waxing and waning of, you know, partisanship and ideological polarization and all the rest. But, right. you know, again, we're, we got a lot of hairy problems, particularly coming out of this pandemic. <laughs> um, so I, it's like you need all hands on deck. And, 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 and this multi-sectoral approach, I think, actually gives you um, access to different kinds of disciplines, different kinds of capital, more likely to solve problems in a, in a sustainable way in many respects. Right. Yeah. And it's funny, we talk about all these differences, regional differences. There also, there's also a lot of similarities. I mean, in Canada, for example, a lot of these the cities out west, a lot of the cities uh, in, on the eastern and central Canada, they all have educational institutions that are kind of, you know, they have their place in the city. Um, public transit systems, whether they're funded properly or not, um, whether they're, you know, evolved, I guess, maybe that's the right word to use, but how far along they are in terms of development. Um, we see similarities in that, especially in these places where maybe the, the city center was neglected a little bit, they're kind of trying to kind of bring that up. And that's pretty similar, I think, in a lot of different places and maybe not in downtown Toronto because downtown Toronto is, you know, doing really well. Um, but in other, some of these other places that Jared mentioned, like uh, Oshawa or Hamilton, maybe have something similar with some of the places uh, uh, out west. So for, a, for the federal government and some things that they have done well in Canada, I think, is they have made some of these funds where you mentioned predictability. They, I think they recently announced uh, the gas tax fund here where they're getting a certain amount of money every year for certain infrastructure projects. Those are the kind of things we've been pushing for for our members and um, it's, it's, it's nice to see that actually happening. Um, hopefully more of that, uh, uh, happens down the road, especially with the different orders of government to kind of, you know, you're talking two plus two equals five to see, yeah, two plus two equals five, two plus two equals six. Cause we know if there's a collaboration between education, uh, you know, transit lines, uh, connectivity, that sort of thing. Um, there's, but there's a lot of potential. Um, but one thing I did want to ask you about Bruce is, you're, you're, a lot of your work kind of focused on metropolitan areas. And so I'm talking about cities like, you know, Toronto, Oshawa, whatever. You're talking about metropolitan regions. Does that, so if we're talking here, how does this include maybe some smaller and rural areas? A lot of our members that uh, kind of rely on us to kind of advocate for them, they come from smaller communities and they're always saying, well, we're not Toronto or we're not Ottawa. How do we kind of you know, how, how does your, what you talk about apply to these communities? Well, that's a great question. I, so the remarkable thing about the U.S. is that sprawl has been underway for so long that most of our major metropolitan areas have gobbled up a lot of rural communities and rural counties. Uh, because the way in which we measure metropolitan statistical areas in the U.S., it's a commuter shed. So once you surpass 20% of your population at the county level that have to travel across jurisdictional lines to get to work, then you're just part of the metropolitan area. So half of people, half of the people who live in rural America actually live in metropolitan areas because sprawl has just gone on for so long that we've just absorbed all of them. If that's true, right, then this urban-rural divide is not really as pronounced as the demagogues and ideologues make it out to be because they're all part of like industrial economies, service economies that have, you know, different parts of the metropolitan area have different purposes. Um, And that's why metropolitan areas are really the organizing unit of the global economy. So I don't, I, I think there's actually more similarities for a very large portion of rural America um, with urban America, because they share this sort of like um, platform industrial structure. Now, for non-metropolitan areas, even they are more complicated because, you know, some of them still have, you know, resource-driven industries. Many of them have become, you know, ecotourism areas. Um, so they're, they're as complicated as city neighborhoods, really. We try to just group them all into one big category. Oh, those are rural communities. But frankly, I think once you go and take a look at their assets and advantages, it's much more complicated. The country, you know, for the U.S., you know, it's it's a place that likes to simplify things because we're just so large. Um, 
But simplification, you know, can have its benefits. In this case, I think it's had its drawbacks. I'm part of a group that is coaching a group of applicants all over the U.S. There was a billion dollar build back better regional challenge to help places scale up their industry clusters. 529 applicants came in. They chose 60 to get some technical assistance. They'll ultimately choose 20 places in the U.S. to get anywhere between 25 million and 100 million. The, it's really interesting to read these applications because it shows how a radically disparate set of places across the country, metro areas, regional areas, rural communities, see their assets. Instead of talking about their deficits, this is like an asset-driven approach. And there's, there's really an enormous amount of possibility out there um, if we can begin to get some across, you know, beyond the sort of partisan divide in particular, which, you know, is so pernicious. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I guess speaking of that, uh, a lot has changed since um, since your book was first published in 2018. Um, yes, the pandemic, new president. Uh, have your thoughts on new localism changed at all? Any anything you want to update? Anything you want to you change? Well, I think there's a lot of disruptive dynamics out there right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I I have to say, I mean, you know, every day it's just like a wild ride. Um, I I will say. I, I feel like new localism and bottom-up problem solving, solving is a structural shift. What is happening in the U.S. is that the federal government is investing at scale in many, many things right, right now. But at the end of the day, I mean, our federal government does not build one house, does not educate one child, does not... I mean, you know, most of what happens in our society is delegated down. And maybe there's federal money in the solution, but in many cases they're not. So I don't think what is happening right now um, has, has, has basically, you know, put new localism back on the shelf. The feds are back, <laughs> you know, we're here. Washington is here to help, you know, I don't think so. I, I think what, what's happened is we've had another burst of federal investment. What we've also had with the federal government, which I think is obviously very, very helpful, is a kind of common market making around climate. And that hasn't really fully, you know, manifested itself. But the, you know, the shift to the electrification of the auto sector, the shift to renewable energies, really the national government has to send market signals here. Um, and I think they're, they're trying to do that. They're still stymied by Congress. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, a year or two from now, we'll probably be back to a pre-COVID world where we're going to have to do an enormous amount of market innovation and financial innovation to make this climate shift. We're not going to really be dependent upon the national government, you know, to do all this. So I think in many respects, what's happening right now uh, affirms new localism. Um, and, and also shows some of the limits of new localism, not as a conceptual idea, but just in terms of capacity. You know, do, do the people on the ground have the capacity, you know, the, the, the personnel, the, the people with knowledge and expertise um, to build coalitions, but also design, finance, and deliver transformative projects and initiatives. And I think, I think that's revealed as we've got a weakness here that we need to shore up. Right. And it seems that um, COVID has, I, I guess, exposed a lot of weaknesses. But um, yeah, you mentioning um, the, the federal government taking on electrification of the auto industry. Um, that's, I guess, to one of my earlier questions, it seems that that's one of the directions that a higher order of government can take to help these lower orders of government um, in terms of climate change as well. It, uh, with them getting behind it and I guess putting their weight behind it, it makes it more of um, a serious topic. I, it's not quite the right word I want to use, but it's the only one I can think of right now. So um, yeah, I understand a little bit more about that. That makes a lot more sense now. Well, we've also had a racial reckoning in the U.S. Yeah. George Floyd's murder. And, and 
you know, we're a we're a changing country. I mean, I you know, the demographics of our country are, are radically shifting. And I do think the Biden administration should be credited for, for putting an enormous focus on equity and inclusion. And, you know, we do have an opportunity here to reduce racial and ethnic disparities on income, health and wealth. You know, whether we'll do it or not is a yeah, damn good question, yeah. but I, I, I think there's clearly a direction here. And again, it will depend on the ability of places to deliver all this stuff. I mean, right. you know, so we can set targets at the national level. We're going to grow black and Latino business in such a way. That's great. That's, you know, helpful. But at the end of the day, it's these ecosystems locally that right. are ultimately going to determine whether that works or not. Well, and I guess as long as everybody's doing their part, you've got the federal government making pushes for this. And then, like you said, the the municipal governments, the the capability, capacity to do it. As long as we run with this collaborative approach, we should come out smelling like guest room soap. Well, look, it's also, we're also post-Trump. I mean, maybe we're not (laughs) post-Trump. I mean, I'm still, we're all still recovering from four years of that individual. I mean, it's all PTSD here all the time. I mean, waking up in a Trump world was just God awful. Um, And, you know, so it's been wonderful to get past that to some level of normalcy, though. Wow, we are divided. We are divided in ways I would never, ever have predicted for the right. I mean, it's really, that is probably the most disturbing aspect of this period. Um, You know, you feel like you wake up every day in a democracy that, you know, is on the edge. Very, very disturbing. And it's not just the U.S. as well. I mean, you look through social media, even in Canada, it's, it's getting divided as well. I don't know if that's spillover from the Trump era in the U.S. or if we're developing our own division. But yeah, I... I agree. It's like, we're not, we're not a unified country like we used to be. People are, um, it's yeah, definitely divided and it's definitely worrisome. Yeah. And there's uh, and Bruce, I don't, not to, you know, worry you even more, but there's been this new, uh, genre of, uh, writing in Canada lately that of what happens when the, when U S democracy fails, uh, there's been a few articles published, uh, recently <laughs> about that and how Canada should react as a country and what would happen to us. And, so the division, yeah, we we're 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 watching, I guess, it uh, with uh, you know a little bit of um, you know anxiousness to see anxiety, see what happens uh, south of the border, but also like Jared mentioned here as well. Yeah, we haven't really seen this kind of uh, instability uh, in the world. I mean, for for a while, for a long time. I mean, I, I and we know what the '30s ended up with. So I mean, there's a lot of precedent here, but. Right. I, I think this is where cities and metropolitan areas actually do matter. They are practicing a kind of problem solving. In most cases, across partisan lines, if you go into any metropolitan area in the United States, the cities tend to be democratic. The periphery tend to be Republican. But I'm at a lot of tables with political leaders and corporate leaders and civic leaders. They clearly are not part of the same political party but they are definitely in the service of their place. I mean, that trumps everything. We are gonna make this place quality and competitive and all the rest of it. Now, whether that can seep up into the national poison, I'm not sure, but the local level seems sane (laughs) (laughs) compared to what goes on at the national level. So. In, in, in what you've been seeing then, so you've seen, you've seen some of this work. You, have you also seen it not work? Have you seen some metropole or some cities just the obstacles have just been too, just too much or has been too slow of the movement? Or what, maybe what are some of those obstacles that you've seen? You know, it's quite interesting because, you know, what I always find about cities and metro areas in the U.S. is they don't tend to do everything together, right? I mean, so in many of these major metropolitan areas, what you'll see is business leadership and philanthropy and elected officials come together around economy shaping, let's say. Um, They won't come together at the metropolitan scale necessarily around housing. or Those are seen as more local issues than metropolitan. 
um, or other social safety net issues. But at the metropolitan scale, they will come together around economy shaping, competitiveness, you know, infrastructure around their distinctive assets. Um, because the clusters that really define metropolitan areas are really quite different. You know, you go into Detroit, it's not, you know, difficult. I mean, this is like an advanced mobility place, particularly building off of auto. You go into greater Philadelphia, this is a life sciences hub, et cetera, et cetera. So we really are quite different in terms of the industries that have grown up around our major universities and corporations and all that. But so I don't think everyone is, it's not like a Monty Python film where, you know, they're all like moving together everywhere. Right? Yeah. They'll tend to collaborate on certain things and then everyone else can go to their own sort of part of the room and do what they want to do about housing or, you know, so many of the other issues that bedevil, you know, um, modern places today. So we're not at like some nirvana here, you know, we're in sort of an iterative evolving, you know, experiment around collaboration across sectors. Um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting, really. I mean, I, I, it's, you know, it also means that any place in the U.S. or anywhere else for that matter, um, with a little gumption, you know, could invent a new problem solving, you know, sort of mechanism and, and, and really, you know, vault to the head of the class. Right. I mean, that's what's so interesting about this period is that um, there's so much innovation happening at the local metropolitan scale. It's like open running here. You know, no one's asking permission from anyone to do this. I mean, it's just like, well, this is our place. We're going to do what we want. So I think it's, I think it's, it's really exhilarating to see all this sort of underway. And the federal investment is just, again, it's, it's a big ballop of money. Yeah. No one should like think it's going to be, it's like a sugar high really in some respects. I mean, it ain't going to be <laughs> here in three years. So if you can maximize it for your own place, go for it. Right. But you better be thinking about what comes after because it may not be there in a very short period of time. So let me ask you this, Bruce. Is there a, a place that you would probably like hold as maybe not the gold standard, but you say, this is the new localism in action. They have done it right. This is what I point to when I'm talking about the new localism. Well, you know, in the book, we talked about a couple different places and, and we talked about, you know, Pittsburgh, you know, uh, coming back from the steel shock of the late 70s in this very collaborative public, private, civic, you know, network. But now, again, they had, they had Carnegie Mellon, the University, you know, University of Pittsburgh. They've got some amazing assets. Yeah. Um, but it took 40 years. They're like a 40 year overnight success story. Right. I mean, it's like <laughs> and it didn't have to end that way. They could have just fought, you know, fought each other to the to the end and, and, and really seen it as a zero sum. But Pittsburgh is an incredible, very informal network. And at different points of their recovery, different players were really leading it. Indianapolis is a much more formalized system. We write about the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, which is really you know, the leaders of the corporations philanthropies and universities sitting around a table, not to discuss, but to decide how to invest in economy shaping and placemaking. So those, you know, those places are pretty impressive. Um, we also threw Copenhagen in the mix because they, they really have invented a mechanism for regenerating your city and using the value that's created along harbors, near airports, to generate revenue for the long term to right. invest in modern infrastructure. You know, so Copenhagen is an incredible financial mechanism, which still has not been adapted into the U.S. for the most part, but should. Hmm. Excellent. Um, all right. We're getting close to our time right now, but I do have one more question. And um, it was one I, I left uh, with Charles Marone when we had him on on the last episode. So I wanted to ask you, too, since you're going to be a keynote speaker at the conference. Um, when, with, when people read your book, when they for example, listen to the podcast that you had a couple of years ago with Charles Marone, which was fantastic, by the way. Um, uh, w when they when they see you at the conference, um, what's one thing you want 
Ontario municipalities to take away from there and to implement in their uh, communities um, to to really dig into new localism and and uh, I guess grow their communities based on it. What's what's one thing that you would uh, want to leave them with? Want them to leave with? Well, I think the most important thing to leave with um, you know municipal officials or other stakeholders is you have agency. I mean, you really can solve problems at the local level, and you don't really need to wait for anyone or, you know, or this laborious process of we have a bill and we're going to move the bill and maybe it'll be funded 100 percent. Maybe it won't. I, I, I and, you know, I don't want to dismiss higher levels of government. They're really important and they right. do set a lot of the rules and make a lot of the investments. But there is so much agency at the local level to solve problems and and frankly to solve problems in different ways. I think we're at the cusp probably of a decade where some of the hardest challenges, social challenges facing our societies, health disparities, can be can be solved in part with new tech innovations and entrepreneurial companies. And we've tended to separate that out. Well we're not going to resolve health disparities through, you know, new tech firms and startups and scale ups. I actually think we can. Um, right. And, you know, we see that in a lot of these build back better applications in the United States, they, they, trying to use market mechanisms uh, in the service of reducing health disparities. So that's local in many respects. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, ideas don't need to wait for, you know, the sort of traditional or conventional public sector processes, many, and I don't want to dismiss it, it's really important, but I think there's this whole other way. We've only used a portion of our power, really. Right. And we need to unleash uh, and lock it. But the most important message is paradigmatic as opposed to programmatic. It's you have power. You have more power than has been given to you by your national or provincial governments because you have market power. Right. You have social power. Use it. Excellent. That's um, that's a really good note to leave on. But uh, I want to give you a couple minutes um, before we go. Uh, if you have anything to say to uh, to our listeners, um, anything you want to say before the conference, before we see you in April. Well, I've always thought that you know Canada and the U.S. should spend a lot more time informing each other. I mean, right. the U.S. is an intensely parochial place. Uh, it's a very large place. It's a very diverse place. But it doesn't get out much, you know. <laughs> so I, I really feel that going forward, post-pandemic, we, we've got to find our, a way to sort of knit our communities together, share practices back and forth across the borders. Right. Um, because, you know, we're both very powerful societies in many respects. And right. um, very similar. I spent a lot of time studying the Nordics and, the, you know, Germany and the Netherlands and so forth. But I think, you know, going forward, it's, we, need, we need to spend a little more attention in our backyard, frankly. Right. We can learn a lot from each other, too. And I guess that's part of you coming to, to Toronto in, uh, in April is, uh, you know, it's part of that, sharing of ideas, seeing what you guys are doing now. What we call south of the border, uh, what you <laughs> call, you know. Um, and, 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 and that's what it's all about. And that's what these conferences are all about, uh, bringing new ideas, sparking new thoughts with the hope of bettering our communities. And uh, the more we do that, the better. So uh, I think I think for me, that's it's a good way to leave off. <laughs> yes, excellent. That's a fantastic way to leave off. All right. Um, we want to thank Bruce for uh, joining us on this episode. It was fantastic to see you, to have you here. We look forward to seeing you in person in April. Great to see you. Looking forward to it. Awesome. All right, everybody else, um, get your tickets for uh, the Good Roads Conference at OGRA conference.ca uh april 10th to 13th um you can check us out on our socials we have updates every day uh, a lot of cool stuff going on at the conference check us out on twitter facebook linkedin all that good stuff um the only other thing i can mention good roads uh courses um Guelph Road School, things like that, uh, MIT, are still ongoing. Some are in virtual, some are going to be live. Check those out as well. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, give us a shout at podcast at goodroads.ca. And uh, until next time, everybody, take it easy. Take it easy.